Secretary Terry, take one. Take 29. <laughs>well we first met in the senate i mean we first met i i think i came to the senate a few years before john and then he came and we met as senators uh, i think it's fair to say we would both acknowledge that in the beginning there was a a little bit of tension and certain uh uh questioning each of the other uh john had come to massachusetts to campaign against me and he wasn't personal or anything he, he came to support the party and I understood that, but obviously I'd have loved it if he hadn't come. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, he uh, and I were on different paths with respect to the war in Vietnam. Uh, so inevitably there was just a little bit of, uh, who is this guy, what's he all about? Uh, uh, we have to get over the past, both of us, and, and we did. That's the important thing. Uh, I mean, it didn't get in the way. Well, obviously, they're, they're extraordinarily different. I mean, John suffered the fate that I think every single person who went there uh, was, you know, hopeful of avoiding and, and terrified of, which was the idea of being captured by the enemy. Um, and I think every person who's ever served in the military has nothing but the highest level of respect for those who fight for their country and then lose their freedom and are held by the enemy and subjected to unspeakable acts of inhumanity of one kind or another. Um, and, and to survive five and a half years plus in, in some of it in solitary confinement is just an extraordinary human feat. So uh, that, his, his war was a war from the air. Um, land on an aircraft carrier, you're there at night, you got the Navy all around you, you got good food, you're, you know, pretty safe in that environment until you get back up in the sky again. And one day he got knocked out of the sky and breaks to both uh, arms and so forth and uh, is captured. Uh, my war was down in the Delta mostly, uh, running around in the rivers, uh, getting shot at, uh, most, almost always in ambushes exclusively, and fighting your way out of the ambush. And seeing the war on a ground level in, in hamlets and with some interaction with Vietnamese people that led me to believe we were on a quixotic errand. And that's why when I came back, uh, I, that and other reasons, the things I saw and what was happening strategically, the decision, everything, weighed on me in a way that made me a very vocal and, and, and uh, determined anti-war activist after I came back. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. When we famously had a, uh, a coming together, which was ironically kind of forced by the seniority system of the United States Senate. We were both members of a delegation going to Kuwait and Baghdad after the uh, liberation of, of uh, Kuwait in Kuwait City. And John and I were by seniority assigned to the same four seated, you know, tabled uh, grouping in, in the plane. And John, I remember distinctly, I was sitting facing forwards in the direction of flight. John was seated opposite me facing, you know, backwards. And there we were, uh, you know, two guys thrown together on a long flight. And uh, uh, neither of us fell asleep early. We were both kind of awake, and we began a conversation. We just got talking, and I asked him a lot of questions about his war, about the prison, about the experience, about the flying, about uh, what he felt, what he saw, and he asked me a question. We had a real, uh, an amazing conversation, which ultimately led the two of us to the same conclusion, which was, uh, the war still raged in too many hearts in our country. Uh, we were not at peace with ourselves in this, uh, in this uh, period. And both of us saw a strategic value in trying to move to a different place with respect to the relationship with Vietnam. So we agreed to work together. 
And um, it really was one of the most important conversations I had in the entire time I was in the United States Senate, and one of the most meaningful. Both of us shared a deep belief as people who had worn the uniform of our country once upon a time, and, and notwithstanding the differences of our service, we were united, uh, you know, ten times over in the notion that the country had an obligation to fulfill our responsibility to let the families of those who were missing and still unaccounted for in action, they needed to get every bit of evidence available to satisfy uh, their, their, uh, this gaping hole in their lives and to, to try to fill it and, and, and give them peace. And John and I understood that whatever strategic interests we might have had in moving to a different relationship with Vietnam would never be possible unless those questions were put to rest. So we uh, agreed, both of us, uh, coming at it slightly different. I mean, John's experience gave him a deep-rooted sense that they had been responsible and tracked every name of every live person. They knew who was where and who was there. Uh, so, I mean, he had some doubts about the legitimacy of this, but when it appeared on the cover of Newsweek that a uh, question mark, are Americans still living in Vietnam? And there are these guys, and there was this whole Rambo, first blood, you know, ethos of, of uh, people being alive and needing to be rescued. So that, the mythology had grown around that, together with real evidence that existed in the Defense Intelligence Agency, the CIA, elsewhere, of last sightings alive. And those set last sightings alive were never followed up on. There was also a belief in some quarters that uh, former Secretary Kissinger had not negotiated for the return of people from Laos and Cambodia. So that lived on, and John and I agreed to tackle that in the context of the PLWMIA committee, which amazingly to me drew really uh, outrageous attacks on John of people who were accusing him of being the Manchurian candidate and, and that he was a traitor and he hadn't lived up. I mean, it was just awful stuff. And, you know, I'd have to reach out and put my arm on John's arm sometimes and just restrain him from uh, lashing back. And he, he, he was really terrific in, in putting up with all of that. We traveled to Vietnam together. We did all kinds of things. But we were each other's wingman during that period of time. And it's one of the proudest accomplishments, I think, because what we did was put together the single most exhaustive, most transparent uh, accounting for missing in war ever performed by any country in the world. No country has ever gone to the lengths that the United States of America still goes to with American troops in Vietnam going down into holes in the ground and digging for the remains of service people to bring back answers to families. And more than 700 families have been able to have closure and, and, and bury their loved one here in the United States as a result of this work. It's extraordinary work. Well, you know, I mean, walking into the Hanoi Hilton, John Kerry with John McCain, particularly because of my own opposition to the war, was obviously a, you know, odd bedfellows journey in the first place, and we both knew that, and we honored that. Uh, and by the way, John, you know, in his spirit of trying to reach out and, and, and put history in its proper place, became friendly with a lot of people who had opposed the war. I mean, you couldn't do otherwise and be a, be a impactful senator in the United States Senate in our country. But John did that. And so when we walked in, uh, we, we were on this mission to try to get answers about the war. And, and he and I just wound up. We, you know, we wandered through, and he showed me. He said, this is where I was. This is where I was. And I walked in with him, alone, the two of us, into this cell with a little bed with tiny quarters. And I just felt this overwhelming sense of how extraordinary it was that here was uh, here were two guys who had different views about the war, had come from a different place, came from a different place politically, but we were finding a special kind of common ground right there in Hanoi in that cell. And that has always stayed with me. It was also a sort of 
you know, together with that conversation, it was kind of the, it was the iconic photograph or metaphor, if you will, in my memory of that journey and of how special it was to have had that relationship with John McCain. Well, we just worked really hard, and we worked with Republican and Democrat administrations alike. You know, John uh, and I uh, worked very closely with General Brent Scowcroft. He was terrific, could not have been less political or less partisan. He had one mission, get the job done. He was a general's general and a great advisor to George H.W. Bush. President Bush was, George H.W. was deeply committed to this endeavor. Uh, he committed resources, he went after it, he lifted, you know, helped move on the embargo, and ultimately uh, we were able to lift it with President Clinton and normalize under President Clinton. And that couldn't have happened without, I think, the, the jointness of the effort between John and, and me and ultimately the contribution of all the members of the committee, Chuck Robb, Bob Kerry, Nancy Kassenbaum, Chuck Grassley, uh, and the whole group of senators who took their obligation seriously, and in the end we had all, I think it was 13 members of this uh, committee, signed the report uh, that declassified millions of pages of documents, provided transparency to, transparency to families, and, and really lanced the boil, if you will, that empowered us to be able to move forward. And John and I would both tell you that, I think John, uh, I mean, we've appeared in many events together talking about this movement to the normalization of Vietnam. And um, we have both often quoted a, a very influential ambassador from, from Vietnam who helped with this process who said how important it was to be able to mention the word Vietnam and not mean a war but mean a country. And I think we've gotten to the place where it's a country and we have a brand new relationship with it that many people couldn't possibly believe given the nature of the war. Look, I, I, I think again, John McCain would tell you just as I am now that uh, there are some people who are never gonna get over it. I mean, I mean, this is a difficult, this was a horribly difficult period in the life of our country. When brothers disagreed with brothers and fathers and sons and Families were divided and fought over this war, uh, and uh, it, it was a very divisive period, perhaps second only to the period of the Civil War itself. And we paid a high price for that uh, division, and, and now Ken Burns's extraordinary film has helped people to see the continuum, to understand the full uh, measure of this journey, and, and I do think that John and I being able to lead the effort to uh, get the answers on the PIWMIA committee together with Bob Smith, who was our vice chairman, and to be able to get to the point of lifting the embargo and moving to normalize, and then having President Clinton go and be the president returning there, and then I went back with President Obama, that transition came about because of the work uh, that we did. And I do think it contributed significantly though I will not venture to say that it has ended some of those divisions, because I'm sure some people will just go to their grave, unfortunately, with uh, hard feelings. You don't have to ha all do the same thing to embody American values. Uh, <clears throat> John's a patriot. I consider that what I did was an act of patriotism. I did it because I love my country, and I thought my country was doing something wrong, and I wanted my country to make that right. And John would say that, I think. There are different ways to be uh, patriotic. I think that um, uh, John obviously personified, uh, you know, a very special naval lineage with his grandfather and his father and his own service. That's quintessentially American in so many different ways. Uh, he was uh, uh, mischievous at uh, the academy and other places too, which is kind of part of our, uh, the nature of being a warrior, and he was a warrior. 
So I think that in all those ways, yes, he, 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 he did. But don't, you don't isolate one particular path as the personification of those values. I think there are loads of people who in their own way have personified American values. The, the beauty of our values, the beauty of America is that you can be who you are, you can be who you want to be, that we accept everything and it melds together and that is the mosaic that makes America. And John fits very prominently and squarely in that mosaic. But uh, there are lots of ways, I think, for, for people to uh, make contributions to that. What is happening today is just plain dangerous, really dangerous. And our democracy, regrettably, and I think John recognizes this in many ways uh, and has talked about it, is threatened because of the amount of money in American politics, because of the you know, uh, Citizens United decision that really takes away any restrictions and forgets about the concept of corruption in the system. Uh, because of the gerrymandering of the United States Congress. Well, we don't have a fully democratic uh, election. In the general election, it's very hard with the districts, the way they're drawn, for a genuine democracy to be reflected. So uh, we're, 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 we've got real challenges right now. And, and what is happening in Washington today is contributing very significantly to those challenges because it is beating up on our democracy. It is beating up on the participants. It is without regard to... Uh, a, a sort of gentle uh, respect and dignity, if you will. It has no dignity, uh, and it is uh, creating a grotesque spectacle out of the American political process, which is losing respect on a global basis. So uh, I'm glad John has spoken out about some of it, uh, some other uh, colleagues, and I hope many more will, because our nation is at risk in this process, not party, but nation. And that is what you swear allegiance to when you take the oath of office in the United States Senate and House. Look, in South Carolina, the attacks on John, personal and on his military record, were both uh, wrong. Uh, they were obscene, they were inappropriate, they had no place in American politics. And, and I think that uh, uh, it was very important for us to stand up for, uh, the, for the truth, for the reality of, of what was being done here and what was stated. I mean, John McCain uh, suffered hugely in prison. He was a hero in the sense, every sense of the word, that he, he lived up to the highest code possible, even if you even if you under torture said one thing or another that you'd mean to, the fact that you went through that torture, the fact that you kept trying to hold on to that code, you know, is, is, is one of the lessons we learned in the course of that war that changed the way in which people were instructed to respond to that kind of, uh, of uh, uh, torture and interrogation. So John, uh, by refusing to go home, when he was offered the chance ahead of people who had been captured before him and where it was just inappropriate, he stood up for the highest values of our country and for the highest values of basic human behavior, leave the country out of it. This is just a matter of fair play and decency and rectitude, and John had a very strong sense of that. because there was nothing personal about it. It had to do with positions, statements made. You know, John hit me just about as hard, if not harder, on the subject of Syria, when I think John knew that I thought we ought to be doing more, and I wasn't happy with where I was, but he took his frustration out, and I understood that uh, you know, that's how he felt, and, and we got over it. We got beyond it. Um, the important thing is that you live every day in the United States Senate, hopefully, with another day coming at you. And if all you do is get churning and broiled up over the last vote and you stay there, you're never going to get the next vote and you're never going to get anything done. So you learn over time how to compartmentalize a little bit. It's not altogether good that you do that in some ways because, I mean, the system doesn't work if you don't. but. In the end, it, it's hard for people to understand how people are doing that, and it's part of what contributes to the sense that 
that Congress is just a place where people play games and it's out of touch. I understand that. But it is what you have to do in order to be able to get through it. It's the personal stuff that I think goes way too far. And we have to get that out of the system now. I mean, it'd be a blessing for American politics if we could just get back to the place where it was based on normal, uh, you know, argument about one issue or another, and you try to score a point at the expense of what someone said or did previously. There's always a chance, because human beings populate the Senate, and human behavior has all kinds of opportunities. I personally believe that the United States Senate and the House could very rapidly be restored to a place of respect in, in America if leaders within the House and Senate were to lead in that direction and just make it clear, you're not going to be a committee chairman, you're not going to be promoted, you're not going to get, we're going to run a different kind of operation here because we're going to do something that respects the American people and respects our own political process in a way that lifts us up as a nation and, and, and makes us an example people want to follow, not something people today uh, look at with scorn in our country and elsewhere. Uh, I think that's the difference. I believe people make a huge difference in this process. And, and if we could reestablish a basic standard of truth, which I know matters to John also, about what the facts are, so that we're making fact-based decisions, uh, that would go a long way towards helping restore faith in the American democratic process. John McCain and I, first of all, I think we both respect each other. There are times when we've made each other mad. Uh, there are times when he's gotten angry at me. There are times when I've gotten angry at him. And yet, we've always had a basic respect that I believe came out of the ultimate friendship that we made later, after the events that sort of took us in different directions. And we both understood how desperate the country and the Senate are for relationships that are forged that way and that are based on that mutual respect and that always try to find the center of that respect. And, and, and I think John and I keep coming back to that because we've traveled some mighty uh, strange and uh, turbulent miles together and separately to come to the same place as senators where we knew we could make a difference. Uh, and I think that, uh, I think that, that uh, you can differ on an issue and differ respectfully and, and differ passionately and still like the person you're differing with. And, and that's very important to us in, in America. A lot of people don't understand that in other countries. As secretary, I would explain that to people. They couldn't understand because they all live in these, you know, many of them in authoritarian, there's only one thing, you only spout one point of view. Nobody dares uh, take on the leadership. Now, that's not us. And that's one of the proudest things about the United States of America that really separates us from everybody else. But now it's gone too far, we gotta bring it back. And John would agree, we've got to bring it back. Well, Teddy, you know, taught all of us a lot about trying to reach out across the aisle. And uh, Teddy would reach anywhere he could find somebody that worked with him on an issue of one kind or another. He was a master at it. And I think John saw the same thing I saw, which was something worth trying to uh, emulate. I, I believe I heard it on the news, but it was so close to a telephone call I got from my office uh, that I can't tell the difference whether it was one or the other, but I was very quick to learn about it. I'm not ready to start defining any of that because John's on his two feet fighting like hell, and that's good. <laughs>